one just let us know. I've got a little voice, I'm sorry. I'd like to welcome Amy Jennings, which a lot of you probably already know, being in the, in the, um, the Stroke Recovery Club. But it's lovely to be able to share information with people who may not know more about it that have come to join us at the library this morning. So thank you for coming. And I'd like to welcome Amy. Thank and you. And Robert. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs>
I was, it was due to an a, a, AVM stroke. I was only 32 years old. I was born with an AVM, but I didn't know. An AVM results in a weakness that can lead to a hemorrhage. The chances of a brain AVM bleeding is one to three percent every year. So the clock had been ticking all my life. Prior to my stroke, I worked as an accountant in Foster. I was a um, CPA qualified and I was going to become a partner in my practice. That's, that was until I had the stroke. I had a bad headache that day. I felt like a, I was, it was like a hangover. So my life changed in an instant. I was taken in to Tari based hospital by ambulance. A <coughs> helicopter threw, threw me to John Hunter um, Hospital in Sydney. Newcastle, sorry, what did I say? Sydney, Newcastle, sorry. I was fighting for my life, not that I can't, can remember. So for about 10 days, I slept, basically slept while the brain swelling reduced. At John Hunter Hospital, I had brain injury to remove, brain surgery to remove the AVM. After two weeks at um, John Hunter Hospital, I went to Rankin Park. Rankin Park is a rehab unit. I was there about six weeks. I could not speak at all, write, understand numbers or read at all. It is like I was in a foreign country, but I didn't know the language. Imagine that. Also, could not move my right leg and arm. Thankfully, I was able to walk within a month, but I was really down and very lonely for the rest of 2013. What we had to decide what was best for me. Not that I really knew what was going on. I went to the Hunter Brain Injury Service, which is in Bar Beach in Newcastle. I was there for nine months. I did more intensive rehab and my speech improved. I didn't know what aphasia was. My speech pathologist told me about it and I started to understand my problem. Sadly, a common problem with stroke survivors, about a third. So, what is aphasia? It typically affects those with a lev <coughs> left side brain injury. It was explained to me that your brain is like your filing cabinet, but all of the files are a mess. It was also explained to me as loss of language, not intelligence. Aphasia may re um, result in the loss of ability to speak or understand spoken and written language. Did you know only 7% of the population knows what aphasia, but there is over 140,000 Australians affected by strokes. Aphasia, what did I say? Stroke? Aphasia. <laughs> so I have 10 top tips um, to with talking about with people with aphasia and I'm going to tell you now. So one, most people
people with aphasia can improve. Two, um, finding the right words can be frustrating. Three, don't rush. Be patient, uh, be slow down and be patient. Four, give me time to think and talk. Don't interrupt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Aphasia is isolated and can make me your make you vulnerable. Six people have affected affect your confidence. Seven. Aphasia can change change friendships. Eight. Social acti um, interact interaction is important. Nine, it's bloody hard. Don't look the other way and ignore me. It's really irritating when that happens. I am a human being. Ten, I want you more, I need more awareness and understand in the community and aphasia is not contagious, so talk to us. If you know, if you are talking to someone with aphasia, always keep me in, in mind. As a um, stroke, survivor, I keep myself very busy. That's the only way I'll improve. I have, I've been helping a couple of stroke survivors with um, severe aphasia. Communication is very hard for them. We practice numbers, um, word, word thinking exercises and other types from apps on the iPad. I still do speech exercises each day. I have a speech pathologist and we do sessions fortnightly. I have uni students that do speech pathology, uh, speech practice with me each week. I do most of that on Skype, which looks looks works really good. Um, I do reading therapy through the community college here as well at the library. With my improvements, I have um, started a Hello Help Assistant course at Hay. I'm almost finished. Thanks, Lo. <laughs> Maybe one day, I can go back to university to do a speech pathologist degree to, um, to improve my physical um, functions. I see a speech, uh, physio. I do Pilates to improve my muscle strength and control. My muscle pain and to reduce spasticity, I have regular remedial massages and Botox injections with a few times a year. I volunteer for lots of research trials into stroke and recovery. I have a car license and drive a modified car. All in all I do, fatigue has a major impact so I, I need to rest regularly. I have medication that assists with, with this. This is common for people with aphasia. I need to rest, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Earlier on my stroke, my therapist told me I had to get back to the community. It was not easy though. Just going to the shops is a challenge if you have aphasia or have a, um, dis a physical disability. I started attending
using the Maitland Major Brief, where <coughs> 20 plus people meet each week. And today, the people, it's, it's now 50 people plus. It's just amazing. They were, this, that was a blessing. I met a lot of people with young and old um, with aphasia had, had, who had suffered a stroke or brain injury. <coughs> it was great to talk to people with the same difficulty I had with speech. From this brief, I really understood the um, advantages such groups can provide. So with the help of the Stroke Recovery Association, last year I set about establishing a stroke group here in Port Macquarie. Now, we now meet twice a month at Darling's Village. Stroke survivors and their carers are welcome. It is also about providing a great atmosphere of inclusion. There, there are many benefits stroke, stroke groups can provide to stroke survivors or those had, that help stroke survivors. Clubs can help build confidence of stroke survivors to get out into the community. Providing support. Be a great source of information, such as, such as about stroke um, recovery and local services available. Promote awareness of stroke and <coughs> injury and the impact for, for this. Ensure you don't feel isolated. Meet people who know when what you're going through. Provide an environment that, that carers, friends and family come together. <laughs> Please. So we have a few other stroke survivors and carers um, in assist today, in attendance today, who would like to share their story as well. So I've got Rondelay, Liz, uh, Jan. Anne, Jan, a Jan, around, <laughs> and. Cole and Lynn. And share your story. Here we go. I'm first, Anna. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Do I have to stand up there? No. I can just sit here. If you want. No, I don't mind. Um, yeah, well, I'm a carer. My husband had a stroke 17 years ago. I can't turn my head like that. I'll have to stand up. <laughs> um, yeah, so 17 years ago, out of the blue, my husband had. Um, just collapsed one night in the shower. He had, as it turned out, he had a blocked carotid artery through a clot to his brain and bang like that, your life changes in an instant. So he spent three months in hospital um, with a lot of therapy, getting him to the stage where he could at least walk and get home. Um, he also has aphasia, which was one of the most difficult things because I had no idea what was, what was in his head. He couldn't say anything. His first two words started with an F and, and the other one was a hell. <laughs> um, he said that for eight months, had never ever sworn in front of me or we had three girls and the girls were like, mum, this is terrible, dad's never said this in front of us. And I'm like, yeah, he has no idea he's saying it and that was the hard thing. And when he did realise he was saying it, he then stopped, yeah. So, but that took eight months. Um, it's helped me being in this stroke group because I can now hear from other people who haven't been able to talk what's inside of them. And then so I can understand now what's inside of Gary sometimes because it gets frustrating. He's got some speech, but he gets 
between three and five words out, and that's as much as the sentence that he can do um, because he just doesn't seem to. That's, that's it. He, lo he loses it after that. But he says a lot of words, so he has a, quite a long vocabulary now, but not in sentences. Um, we've worked with it. We've, he's had a lot of physio. He's had a lot of different therapies over the time. Um, and we've just sort of worked along with focus on what he can do and not what he can't do. Um, we still lead quite an active life. We've been able to travel. He was 53 when he had the stroke. Um, he's now 70. Um, and we've done a lot of things. He has a mobility scooter. He gets around town on that. Um, often socialises with people along the way, sees somebody having coffee that he knows, stops off and has a coffee. Um, likes to go to his local pub at Finian's. Um, they're all very good there with him. Everybody knows him. So, yeah, that's we just have... Um, we just plot along. Yeah. But I've gained so much out of this group. It's helped me immensely. And I came along to it um, thinking that I might have been able to contribute something as a carer, but they've all given me much more than what I could <coughs> give them. So it's been wonderful. So that's just our story in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Driving my car at the time, and luckily the people sort of around me knew that there was something wrong, but I had stopped at a busy intersection. So they called the ambulance, and as soon as the ambulance turned up, they knew they did the flask, the face, the arm, my speech, and um, so they got me to the ambulance, got me to the base hospital straight away in the ambulance. And within the four hour time slot, the doctor on duty gave me the clot busting drug. Warhope uh, to do physio. They thought at the time Warhope was probably the best place for for physio for me, and it was because the lady there, um, Irene, her name was the physiotherapist there, helped me, got me back to walking because I was in a wheelchair for quite a few weeks and I couldn't walk, and my whole left side was affected. Um, so Irene got me walking again. So I spent six weeks in, in uh, Warhope, just constantly walking and walking and walking. And I think that's what it is. Optimistic, you have to you know, realise that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and um, just keep going, pushing ourselves so hard. But every day for 10 years, I have done my therapy, either starting off in hospital and then when I got home, um, it was therapy every day myself. But it was just my own, you know, pushing myself. And, okay, it's time now to do some exercises. And I still do it every day. And I think that's what you have to do to, do, to get through being a stroke survivor. Anyway, that's what Amy's gone through and we've all gone through. chair with me <laughs> because that thing fatigue is bad. <laughs> My name is Ray Abrams, I'm 89 years of age and 12, two weeks ago, 12 months ago, I had some visitors down from Bathurst. Anyhow, I come back from taking a shower and all around and my right hand lost all the feeling, it went numb. So I didn't think much about it. The next week I drove down to Sydney, come back, two days later, my left hand, my right hand went numb again. I didn't think much about it. Three days later, I couldn't talk. I had pains, Failing down the side of my mouth, my neck, and I couldn't put two words together. They raced me up the hospital, they wired me up for sound, stuck me in a room. 
three hours later they said, you can go home. I'd had a TIA. So home I went. <coughs> Two days later, I was back up the hospital. <coughs> when I went up there during the week, I practically got sent home after three hours. When I went in at the weekend, they kept me there because there was no doctors of sufficient to treat me. They stuck me up in the stroke ward upstairs. That was great. I ended up having four TIAs and went to hospital on the four occasions. The doctor said to me, when I saw the specialist, he said, we can't do much for you. So I said, all right then. So I had another TIA. So I just sat in my comfortable chair, closed my eyes and got a bit of rest and uh, I started treating them myself. I don't take tablets for it. What I have lost through uh, having the TIAs is my spelling. I lost all, all spelling. I've got arthritis in the hands, so I use a computer to write letters. But my spelling has just gone right down, probably the kindergarten. Most words, you're right, and they don't look right. But that's what it is. That's happened 12 months ago. I get fatigued. I, if I start to do too much, I've got to sit down and have a rest. I feel it coming on. I do all my own cooking, live by myself, and that's it. But that's mine. You know, I don't know how long I've got to go, but I'm still wandering around, and that's it. Thank you.
Dallas for four and a half minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was my mum's carer and I had a restless night and I woke up and I knew, I mean, I set the alarm because I had to get my mum's breakfast before the carer lady arrived to shower her. So I sort of staggered out, you know, like as you do. I mean, I'm not a morning person. Mornings are really not my thing. But this was, you know, 7.30 or some ridiculous hour. <laughs> and um, I just couldn't figure out what I had to do. I knew there was something to do with breakfast. I had to get mum's breakfast. But I couldn't figure out what to do. So I knew the microwave was involved somehow. So I stood at the microwave for a while and tried to figure out what it was I had to do with it. And I pushed some buttons on it and the door opened and I had a look inside and I thought, yeah, that's what it's supposed to do. But I didn't know what to do. So I rang my sister-in-law and I don't know how I could ring the phone. It's beyond me. But I rang her and said, I think I've had a stroke or something. And she said, oh, well, what, what's happened? I said, well, I don't know. I just can't figure out what to do with anything. I'm just confused. And so she came racing around and um, she said, oh, I think we'll get the ambulance. And I said, so I just don't know what to do. It'll pass. And she said, no, no, I think we'll get the ambulance. So she did, and I said to the ambulance, but oh, I don't know what, why, but, you know, well, you know, we'll, I'll go, you know, but it seems a bit over the top, you know. So. And so I went up to the hospital, and you know, they sent me to John Hunter and the rest, and I had had not a clot, but a bleed in the brain. And so by the time we got to John Hunter at about one o'clock in the morning of that day, um, I didn't know my name. I had no idea uh, what it was. You could have told me anything and I'd have said, oh, okay. But I could still talk, which was quite unusual. So people at John Hunter, being the teaching hospital, were very enthusiastic about having all of the students talk to me because I could talk, but I didn't know anything else. I can't remember how many times I was asked, what day is it? What's your name? Who's the Prime Minister? Until eventually I said, mate, if I don't know what my bloody name is, <laughs> why are you asking me who the Prime Minister is? This is ludicrous. So I still knew the stupidity of it and I still knew the words. So at that stage, anyway. Eventually they decided they didn't need, yeah, after all the MRIs and things, that I didn't need an operation. I stayed down there for four days, four or five days, and they decided that they could send me home, which they did, put me in the um, the ward where all the, the dementia people, people go, because they didn't have anywhere else. It's a bit weird, strange, you know. Anyway, then I went up to Warhope, and so I figured, okay, this is rehabilitation, so I have to not just learn how to dress yourself and, and you know, sort of shower and stuff. But I figured to survive, I would have to be able to at least write my name on the bank form. If I could write my name on a bank form, I could survive. And so that was what I, set out to do. So every morning, as soon as breakfast was over, which is at about eight o'clock in these places, it's crazy for a person who likes to sleep. <laughs> so I would set up in, with my back to the sun because it was winter, um, 
in the little lunchroom and get my pen and try to copy out the letters and write my name. And <coughs> have you ever heard of the, you know, how your brain rewires itself when people have a stroke? You've heard of that? Mm -hmm. Yes, some people have. And I had read about that as well because I was an adult literacy teacher and I found that very interesting. And also interesting that I couldn't read and write now after that, it was a bit, you know. But I thought, well, you know, this is just, it's just interesting that was in my head that that happened. And so I would just try and write, try and write and try and look at the paper and see if I could read any words. And that's how I filled in my time at the rehab. And so after about three or four days of trying to write my name, I just, suddenly I could write two letters of it. Wow, that's pretty cool when you can't write anything, <laughs> two letters. And it had another letter, so write another, you know, and then, few days later, you get the whole word, it's all there, zap, complete. So you start on the, the surname, which is Freeman, I don't know which one it is. And so you, you start and you practice, you practice, you practice, you practice. And it's, it's boring and it's tedious, but you just keep on, you go and have a little walk and you come back and you do it again. And you know, I mean, I do different things, you know, I might try the numbers, I might try a puzzle where you're looking for numbers or letters or whatever. But I treated it like a job and I did it the same way you would a job. You get up, you have a little walk, you go around, you have a chat, but then you come back to the job because that's what you do. And that continuing practice <coughs> and all of a sudden I had the man part of Freeman. It was there in the back. Wow. And only the next day I got the whole name. And so I could actually write my whole name. And it was just, it was like the sun just burst in, you know, burst out because it was just <coughs> to be suddenly, to be able to see that, you know, the practice, the trying, the, you know, the constant trying it and it, it was back, it was there. And so it gave me hope that I, that that would happen, that it would keep happening and it did keep happening. If you, if you do something and you keep trying it, trying it, trying it, and you know, a lot of times it'll come back. It might not come back all the time, you might get tired and you might lose a lot of those things because that happens to me a lot too. But it's just, it's, it's there and it can happen can rewire and it's just amazing it's wonderful so don't give up because it can happen but there's a lot of perspiration not just the inspiration okay so i hope you will be you have helped everyone understand stroke aphasia and our own stroke journey a little so um, we've got some pamphlets and some flyers um, and um, some um, morning tea. Um, I'll, I'd like to thank the Port Macquarie Library to, for providing a, a, us the opportunity to talk today. So thank you for coming along. Thank you.